there we go. So welcome, Roland. Very nice to have you here. And we had some interesting chats before. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to you and you can get going. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christian. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today about Voyager. And I will share my screen here. And we'll get going. Let's see. <clears throat> All righty, how are we doing? Have we got a uh, opening slide showing for everybody? Christian, are we good? Yes, we're good. Sorry, I muted myself. Okay, yes, no we, problem. We're good. Just want to make good. sure, otherwise, we will get going. So today, I want to talk a little bit about. I see we've got a, a range of uh, experience here. I'm going to give, give a brief introduction to Voyager. Talk somewhat about the devices that you can plug into Voyager. It is, uh, you know, automation software. A little bit about the key features. Some of the optional and advanced features is really some exciting new things coming uh, from a Voyager Advance, which is in beta currently. And then a demo. So we might do five, 10 minutes of, of slides, and then we're going to walk through uh, a demo of the software. And if we have time, we'll, we'll give you a sneak peek at the uh, automated scheduler that I've been using now for about a month. And uh, also, if we have time, we can do a question and answer, and Christian will moderate those questions for us. So who am I? Uh, like many of you, I started early with uh, visual. I had a six-inch Criterion RV6 Newtonian. And uh, I thought it was really great when you could see rings of Saturn and uh, there's Jupiter and, you know, those kind of basic objects, dumbbell nebula. I uh, went off to school thinking I was going to go into astronomy full time, got an undergraduate degree in physics and astronomy. Back then we did astrophotography with, a, with film and we had a dark room in the observatory. We've come a long way since then. Uh, and then I went over to the dark side of software. So my entire professional career was spent as a developer, manager, and executive, and I'm semi-retired now. I can't seem to stop working, but uh, I'm, I'm trying. And about six years ago, I got back into astronomy, uh, started with some visual, uh, then a little bit of EAA, and quickly decided I wanted to really go in deep with astrophotography. And then two years ago, we moved to a little darker location to be closer to our adult kids, a uh, little darker sky, SQM21. So I could see the Milky Way again for the first time since uh, I lived in New York 50 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I had the folks from Backyard Observatories come out and build this roll off roof that you see in the picture. And uh, since I couldn't pick a focal length, I decided to get three piers going. <laughs> so, so I have three rigs that I run most, most nights with, uh, you see an Esprit 80 there for the 400 millimeter wider field. Uh, and then an ONTC 8-inch Newtonian, which uh, is nice kind of middle ground, 940 uh, millimeter focal length. And then a, uh, uh, an SCT here, it's an Edge HD 9 and a quarter, and that's about uh, 1645 millimeter focal length. So we can zoom in on some of the, the smaller galaxies with that. So that's enough about me. Let's get on to Voyager. So I found Voyager in December of 2018. And at the time, I'd used a lot of different software. In fact, I've, on my website, I've got a uh, kind of a survey of imaging software because I think I'd, I'd used it all. I'm a, I'm a proud supporter of licenses of lots of developers of, of astrophotography software. And Voyager uh, really focused on reliable automation of quality deep sky data. So the philosophy is a little different uh, than a number of packages. And uh, if you look at Voyager's architecture and feature set, you'll find that that philosophy really drives a lot of the design decisions. So here's, here's Leo, Leonardo Arazzi, who is the Italian astro imager who built Voyager. And he initially built it just for himself. Uh, he is a professional developing real-time software for the banking industry. So he understands a lot about reliability and security. Uh, and he wanted, when he, when he took the time to go all his equipment off to a dark site somewhere. He wanted to make sure that he got data. Uh, he didn't want to have things hang in the middle of the night and you wake up in the morning and you're missing data. And he also liked to sleep. So he wanted something he could trust to run his system overnight without having to babysit it. And, uh, you know, fast forward to today and Voyager is now in use by people all around the world. And it's, it's everything from the guys who set up on a nightly basis to uh, professional observatories. One of the things that really attracted me to Voyager when I did my survey of imaging software was an extremely wide array of choices uh, for all the different things that it can integrate. So from camera to mounts to guiding, I had used ACP with Maxim DL, 
I'd used the Sky X. I wanted to use PhD2 for a while for guiding because they were doing a lot of good things with it. Uh, and Voyager supported all three of those. Uh, if you go down the list, you can see, I'm not going to read all this, uh, but a, a very wide range of options that you can you, that you can automate with Voyager. And if you look at uh, what Voyager can do, it's got a very wide range of, of features as well. Everything from uh, point and shoot where you can go to an object and we'll take a look at this and just take one picture to uh, running a script or a sequence that runs multiple targets uh, to the new beta, which is an automated scheduler, which is a very exciting development. You basically load up a database with all the targets you want and it'll shoot them at the time that you think is best. So you give it constraints for when you want it to shoot the target and it'll start shooting them at those times. It's got an excellent focus algorithm. I'll show you, uh, since it's, it's broad daylight here. So unfortunately I can't give you a live demo but I shot some really short little videos to show you the, uh, the focus in action. Uh, and, it, and it's guiding, you can use the native star selection of your guiding tool or Voyager also has algorithms to pick uh, a guide star for you. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a lot of these things so I'm not gonna detail them all here. Meridian flips, uh, I, I've had a number of problems with previous software packages where Meridian flips were a hang up. Uh, once I got Voyager set up, uh, it really just, just did it. And you know, stepping back a bit and my, my comment on the bottom here, reliability, honestly, in preparing this presentation, I had to go back and research some things because Voyager works so well. I just started up in the afternoon, clicked the button to run my scripts and that's it. Next morning I got my data. <laughs> so I really, uh, I don't do much more than add targets to the database. Uh, it does have, and this was one of the things that was important to me, uh, the ability to suspend if clouds roll in, but then get, you know, get back rolling again when the clouds are gone, but pick up with the right target. So in other words, some of the packages that I looked at would want to resume whatever was in progress at the time the clouds rolled in. Well, that might not be the right target anymore. It's, it may not even be visible. And Voyager was smart about that. There is a, a, a built-in drag and drop script builder. It's more of a sequencer. It's optional. You don't have to use it, but if you want to use it, you can build a script to do everything from startup to shutdown or just something really simple. We'll take a look at that. So we'll look at most of these things. So we'll get moving here. There's also a, a built-in FITS file, file viewer, which is kind of a funny story here because when I started working on Voyager, uh, the only documentation was uh, a short file in Italian. And so as part of my getting to learn it project, I decided to get out Google Translate, translated it to English, and uh, as Christian said, I'm kind of a, a learner and a tinkerer. And I thought, yeah, maybe I'll build a wiki. So I started, uh, I loaded up a wiki and started writing documentation for Voyager and contacted Leo and said, hey, do you mind if I build this, this wiki for your documentation? And he said, no, go for it. Uh, so I did that. And that's how I got to know Leo. So I worked with him on that, that documentation project. And at that time, there was no Fitz viewer in Voyager. And Leo's opinion was, the data is going to be there. Why do you want to look at it at your sleep? So it took quite some arm twisting to get Leo to uh, to build the, this viewer, which is an excellent viewer. Uh, and once he did, though, I, I was laughing because I got emails from him saying, oh, I just love watching stuff rolling in on the viewer now. <laughs> it's, it all looks so great. So, And I do like that you've probably seen different viewers with different software packages. And some of them present a very grainy, kind of crummy looking image. And others present a really nice one. This is this is a really nice. Uh, it uses the PixSense algorithm uh, for auto stretch, so you get a really nice image as it comes in. Oh, and also just quickly that again the the reliability being key, rather than just building this into the the core Voyager engine, this runs in its own separate program. Uh, and the reason for that is it just doesn't want anything that would potentially interfere with the real time activity that's going on in the Voyager product uh, that's running your scope. There's a nice web dashboard as well. So you can run uh, from a from a uh, tablet or a phone or a desktop and do everything you need to do uh, on a remote Voyager PC. Uh, so you can either use your remote desktop and you know dial into your scope PC if you're if you have something running outside, or you can use the web dashboard. We'll take a look at that too. There is a framing wizard uh, which downloads from Aladdin. So it connects to your Voyager instance and it knows 
uh, information about your field of view based on the Voyager profile that you're using. You can search and find an object uh, and set it up and then save it as a target. It handles mosaics as well. Uh, and then there's a companion product. If you have an observatory and you have a lot of sensors and relays, you might be checking things like, is the scope parked? Uh, there's a product called Viking, uh, which will con connect to all those sensor switches and relays, and then also then let you test and set values uh, from your script. So you don't have to use this for observatory automation. I actually, I have a uh, Lunatico Ast Astronomica, Astronomica uh, Dragonfly controller. And I've got things plugged into that. And then I talked to that from Voyager. But for a lot of people, this is a nice way to, uh, to automate their observatory. There's also an array system. So if you, if you want to run more than one OTA uh, telescope imaging system on a single mount, you can do that with Voyager. You can run it all on one PC, or you can run multiple PCs. And what this does is if you're, if you're imaging the same target from multiple OTAs, you don't want to be dithering on, uh, on one scope while the other one is taking pictures. So this will synchronize to make sure things like autofocus and meridian flip and, uh, and guiding changes uh, are coordinated and don't interfere with the pictures you're taking on any single scope. This is uh, one of the professional observatories uh, in Thailand that's running uh, the Voyager array. They were probably the first uh, adopter of the, the wide field array system. As I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things I really liked about Voyager was the ability to suspend, resume, or exit uh, based on events coming in like, uh, like clouds. And it'll restart when it's safe to do, do so, and it's smart enough to skip ahead. Uh, and I'll show you uh, some of the examples of this, but you have complete control over what you want to do based on each event. You may want to park your scope. Uh, you may want to close your roof. You may want to send an email notification. It's up to you. You can do pretty much anything you need to do when these events occur. And there's a recent uh, addition. There's an optional plugin that if you if you have an observatory with multiple peers, uh, this event handling can be all centralized in one system, uh, like the system you see on the left here. And then those signals are sent to the other systems running Voyager. So you don't have the problem where you know, if each system is trying to control the roof, uh, who, who wins? You really don't want that situation. And uh, some of the things that a lot of Voyager users are not even aware of, but one of the reasons that it, it runs so well and it's so reliable is it has uh, quite a bit of, of AI autonoma, automata built in. Uh, so it will learn from things like autofocus and guiding experience. It keeps statistics and things will improve with time. So let's take a look at the autofocus. Again, this is something I can't really demo right now. Uh, there's, there's two different kinds of autofocus built in. And you can, if you really want to use Focus Max or the Sky X, uh, uh, you can use other external focuses as well. But I love the, uh, the Voyager RoboFire. It's very, very good. So it's got a single star, which if you have, if you have a perfectly flat field, it doesn't really matter. But uh, in some cases, you might have a small difference. And, a single star is going to optimize your focus for the center of your field. So if you're doing a, a galaxy or a smaller target, uh, this might be the best choice. And then there's also a local field multi-star, which optimizes your focus across the full frame. And you just have to run this wizard once when you're uh, first setting up Voyager, and it'll create a V-curve for your imaging system. Uh, and then those V-curves are good forever. So until, until you change your imaging system, you know, you're good to go. So this is a, a video showing the, the creation of a V-curve with, uh, with the initial system. So you can see up in the right there, it's, uh, it's taking pictures of a single star. And the graph below, it's looking at focuser positions and the uh, half flux diameter of the star. And this one worked out nicely. You can tell it's an SCT because we got the middle obstruction in the picture there. Uh, and then it ended with uh, drawing where it found the focus point to be. So typically when you're just starting, you might run this three times, four times, just to get a couple of E curves because with seeing, you know, you might have some small differences, uh, but then it will average them all together uh, and use that going forward. So 
then once you've got your v-curve set up and you want to actually take uh, uh, a focus a focus run in real time uh, the single star looks like this so it will take pictures and you can see the the focus position the star width uh, and this is the curve of the light from the star and then when it's established whoops let's go back to the very end there when it's established the position there it found an hfd of 4.3 uh, and the focuser is at 14 134 so that was i sped this up for the sake of the video but normally my focus runs take about 30 seconds with single star uh, if you have a good focus star in your field uh, you can use it without slewing, but I generally just set it up to find a focus star uh, based on its internal database of good focus stars. And so it'll slew to one, uh, take the focus, and then slew back to your target and continue imaging. So the other, other uh, autofocus is the local field. So this is a multi-star system. So you see uh, a graph here that is showing the average HFD at different parts of the field. So when we run this, red, the reddish uh, HFDs are larger and the blue are smaller. So we want to get to blue. It's using the same V-curve, so we don't have to create a new V-curve uh, for it. And it just moved the focuser, took another picture, analyzed it, and we're getting bluer. So we're getting good. And very shortly, it's coming back up the V-curve. So now it's getting less blue because it's coming up the other side of the V-curve with the focuser position. And there you see the green uh, line where it's determined the best focus position is and it, it moves uh, the focuser to that position and declares that we're done with focusing. So these are really nice uh, focus algorithms. I use them all the time. Uh, you can just embed them into your sequence so they happen automatically. We'll, we'll take a look at that. All right, so that's the, the slide portion. Let's, let's do a demo here. So I'm going to go through, uh, set up a little bit of the on the fly where you can just do things when you're sitting at a dashboard. We'll look at the, uh, the web dashboard and RoboClip. I'll show you the plate solve and precise pointing camera sequences. There's a research and survey uh, function built in, which lets you do things like uh, uh, if you're looking for planet transits and you want to uh, image a lot of different objects at different times during the night. Uh, and then we'll take a look at the scripting. And if we have time, Voyager advanced. So let me switch back over to Voyager. And it's a little bit obscured by my Zoom bar. Is it okay, uh, Christian? You can just give me a thumbs up if it's okay here for seeing the whole Voyager screen no, or should looks, I make it? It looks, it looks fine. It's good. Okay, great. All right. So we're now in Voyager. And what I'm doing today, because it is, uh, it is broad daylight here, I'm using the Sky X uh, for my uh, simulators. Because it actually has pretty nice simulators that even will download a uh, JPEG from the DSS database. And you can even you know, simulate plate solving on it. So we'll be able to see Voyager the way it would really run, uh, even though it's daylight here. So if we go into the, uh, the setup panels, again, these are areas where, you know, once you set this stuff up, you're probably never going to look at it you know, or rarely look at it again. Uh, I can't change anything because I'm connected. So let me disconnect. Go back to setup. Again, the really nice thing I found was just the variety of, of different cameras and mounts and guiding and planetarium. So very wide range here. I'm using the SkyX camera add-on. Uh, you've got, there's a lot of ZWO cameras out there. They have uh, both ASCOM and the, and the ASI camera direct drivers, FLIs, QHYs, et cetera. Uh, so many settings, obviously I can't go through these here. I should mention that there is a, and I'll give you the link for this, there is a free trial version of Voyager. Uh, it runs for 45 days. Uh, there's also a demo version, which run forever, but it's limited to one hour uh, of operating time. 
looking at the mount again here i'm using the sky x but you can do ascom uh, if you have the array version of Voyager, this is where you would start setting up the array. Guiding systems, Maxim, PhD, the sky. Planetarium. Some people will say, well, why do you want a planetarium? Uh, basically for looking up targets. So it's, it's nice to, to be able to access your planetarium uh, to find a target and get the coordinates. And it supports a lot of the popular ones. Also plate solving, again, lots of different options for plate solving. Autofocus, I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not doing it here because uh, you really, I, I don't have, uh, it's not night, <laughs> simply. Uh, rotators, flats, you, you can use pan, flat panels. What I do now, I'm, I've been just doing all sky flats. So I take uh, sky flats at both Dusk and dawn, I pick up uh, usually 10 with each filter uh, and I just keep them on my scope PC and I create new flats every couple of months. Um, uh, I find that things don't change that much in an observatory with fixed peers. So I really don't need to recreate the flats every day. Uh, we've got dome support, both with ASCOM, Next Dome, Scope Dome, the Sky dope, uh, Dome add-on. Weather, I have an AAG cloud watcher for my observatory. Uh, so this is where you would get the cloud data that uh, triggers the emergency events, which tell you whether to suspend or shut down. Observing conditions. So if you want to keep track, if you have an observing condition monitor or an SQM sky brightness sensor, and you want to use those to decide, you might decide in your script that based on the sky brightness, uh, it's time to do narrowband. Uh, or it's time to do broadband. So you can, can, you can check those settings, uh, values, and make decisions appropriately. Safety monitor, you might just have a, uh, uh, like with my, uh, my AAG Solo, uh, it has a switch that comes on when it says it's not safe due to rain or humidity or wind uh, or clouds. This is where you would connect to Viking if you had that optional uh, product that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a lot of Voyager settings here, specific to things like where to store your images and how to uh, change your, your file path so you can customize the file path, uh, the file name and the path. And uh, here's where you would turn on some of the remote things. So you can decide to allow the web dashboard. Uh, you can set up a... Uh, a login, a password, if you want, for your uh, your dashboard. And there's also Voyagers at the core has an application server. So if you're a developer and you want to interface with Voyager at the at an API level, you can talk to the application server. So a lot there. And again, you know, didn't take the, the first time I set up Voyager. Uh, I had one peer in my in my yard at the uh, previous residence, and I got it all going the first night. I mean, it took me about three hours of getting everything set up from plate solving to autofocus, and I was taking images that night. Uh, and I had used several other products beforehand, so obviously, if you're if you're new to imaging, this can be a bit overwhelming, and uh, you can do things step by step. Get your mount and camera going, then start trying to get plate solving going or you know, obviously get your autofocus going before, but you can, you can certainly do things step by step. So this is uh, just the startup section where you connect to your equipment. So we'll, we'll click the connect button uh, and it's hooking up now to the sky. And you can see as it makes the connections, if they're in green, that's a good sign. Things are happening right. Uh, and then we start getting these little widgets lighting up on the side here. Uh, here's our camera, and we're, our virtual camera is cooled to minus 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, these are our, our coordinates where our mount is pointing. Uh, we don't have a target loaded right now, but if we do, we'll get a little ephemeris here that shows us uh, the target's transit time and uh, rise and set time during the night, and so forth. Down in this window is a, basically a log of everything that's going on. So we got a little log here saying that we've connected to uh, the SkyX and we're ready to get going.
So let's go over to uh, the on the fly panel. So on the fly, these are all things that you know you would do uh, manually. Basically, you're sitting at the scope, you've got your camera and your gear connected through the startup panel, and you want to actually do something. Uh, so if we look at, let me bring up the sky. And I have to move it over here, see if it is visible. So this is my my simulated. I'll move their camera out of the way. So here's uh, the current uh, sky. If I do look up in the sky, it'll show me an overhead view. I can zoom in a bit, and uh, you know, let's just pick a target. What's this looks interesting? Yeah. Let me try to get. Let's see if. Uh, We've got a, a nice galaxy, NGC 16. That's probably not going to show up like much in the camera, but let's take a look anyway. So we'll go back over to Voyager. And here's where you can now access the planetarium to look up the coordinates for a target. So since I'm connected to a planetarium, I can just hit fast find and boom, there are the coordinates loaded in. If I click go to, We'll see my virtual telescope doing a go-to. Go back over to Voyager. Let's say I wanted to really make sure I was going there and I wanted to do a uh, precise pointing. So it would do the go-to, it would do a take a picture, do a plate solve, and make adjustments if necessary. Well, let's let's make it interesting and we'll we'll click go to near zenith. So we're now moving away from our target. And then I'll bring back, this is, this is a little viewer that the sky X will show us when it takes a picture. And let's say we want to now go precise pointing to the target coordinates. So these are the target coordinates that we just loaded in. Click precise pointing and it is now slewing to the target. It's set, waiting for settling time. It's taking a, a picture. Oh, there's the picture, there's our galaxy. And this is just, again, downloaded from DSS. It's doing a sync. Oh, it says it's a little bit out of range, so it's going to move it a little further. Oh, OK, that time it solved it, and it's now in range. Oh, we're out of range again. OK. And I had this set up to try several times. And of course, I'm choosing a different target than the one that synced last time. <laughs> you know, this is real. So you can, you can see here, you can give a range uh, of accepted distance from the target. And here it's saying it's 31 seconds away from the target, according to the plate solving that came back. So that's not very far <laughs> from where it should be. But if I widen to say to 50 seconds uh, for my acceptable plate solving range, uh, that then it would have said that was okay and stopped there. But anyway, you can see the, the idea. You can precisely uh, point and go directly to a target. We've also got the ability to do lookups uh, in with Aladdin. So let's say, I think M45 might be up now. So there's M45. I can say, use that, switch my target. NGC 1432 is an alternate name for it. We'll get crazy here and we'll try moving to it. So now we're slewing. We're taking a picture. There it is. So we have kind of a small field of view here, but there's M45. And that one, so the plate solving there was within 16 seconds. So it was, that was within the, the limits that I had set for my plate solving. So we're now pointing at M45 uh, and we'll be ready to take pictures if we wanted to. Uh, one other quick thing, just to show you the web dashboard. So here's the, the Voyager web dashboard, which I can use remotely. Uh, I think this is all set up to connect. Yes. And here I can also 
I have a virtual field of view. So I'd already looked for up M45 with this one. Uh, but I can just, I can show you if I did M42, just to give you the idea, it's going to go look it up in Aladdin. And again, I got a small field of view here, but there's good old M42. Uh, I then have what's called the RoboClip database. So this is a database that you can create uh, with Voyager where you can save as many targets as you want, and then you can use them later uh, in Voyager to create uh, sequences uh, or take single images or anywhere that you need coordinates of, a, of an object. So if I say here, get the data from the virtual field of view, and actually let me go back and show you the, let's go back to M45. So if I didn't like that framing, and again, this is you know really a, not the greatest camera field of view to be doing M45, but I could move it around with a drag system here uh, and say, okay, that's I like that framing. Let me use that data. And then that'll now populate the right ascension and uh, declination for that. I could type in M45 and I could save it to the database. Now I can use it as a target within Voyager. Uh, let's say I wanted to do a mosaic. So I said, well, this is, you know, I'm going to have to go bigger to get this within here. Is that big enough? Yeah, maybe I need to go even bigger. So I'll go to three by three. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm almost there. Maybe three by four. Four by four. Okay, so now I've got all M45 with a mosaic. I can go back to RoboClip, get the data, and this is now going to be my M45 mosaic. And I haven't set this, this is just a, a Voyager installation on my, my desktop PC, but you could, you could create groups. So I could say mosaics is a group. Uh, my... M45 mosaic and save it. And now I've got, a, I can now set up and uh, image that mosaic from back in Voyager. And we're not running right now, but if we were, if we were running a sequence within this web dashboard, we'd see the guiding uh, results, image statistics, last focus, cooler status. So basically everything you want to know about your system uh, is available here in the, in the dashboard. So let's go back to Voyager again. And we just saved that uh, target to RoboClip. Well, here they are. So there's my M45 and my M45 mosaic. So if I wanted to pick that from my RoboClip database, I could just say use selected target. And now I've got the target the way I framed it. And if I said to precise point to those coordinates, we should see a little different picture coming up here. Yep. Again, we're, we're not, obviously this is one image frame, not a whole mosaic. And there it is. So there's our, the way we frame things in the web dashboard. So you can play around with, the, with this and, and take sing, single images, but pretty soon you're gonna wanna do more of a sequence. So let's say I, I want to take a couple hours worth of pictures of M45. And gee, I've already got it in my, uh, my RoboClip database. So I can just pull my target in from there. And I can say, I want to take a light frame with the luminance filter and we'll actually run it here. So let's do really short exposure, like, uh, like a two second exposure. Uh, if I have a CMOS camera and I need to set gain and offset, I can set them here. Let's do like maybe four images. Copy and paste this and we'll do the red filter. Copy and paste that and we'll do the blue filter. Oh, I violated. I'm supposed to do green. <laughs> need to do RGB, not RBG. And there we go. So I've now got a sequence that I can run to take uh, two exposures through each of these filters and repeat four times. So it'll be eight, 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 eight. So you have two options when you are running a sequence. The cyclic round 
will actually take one with each filter and then go back around and take one with each filter. And you can see this little luminance, you know, clear, red, green, blue, clear, red, green, blue. That's the way this sequence is going to shoot. But if I say, yeah, I don't really want to take the time to change filters. I'd rather just do all my luminance, then my reds, then my greens, then my blues. You can change that setting here. Uh, and now it'll do uh, all my luminance, all my reds, all my greens, all my blues. And I could say, yeah, I want to do that. But actually, I want to do that three times. And so now I'm going to do you know, four, four repeats of luminance, four repeats of red. And then I'm going to go back again and do them all over again. Uh, again, lots of things to set up here that we don't really have time to, to go through. Uh, constraints, I might say, gee, you know, I, I really don't want to do this target unless it's above. I better say something low here because I think it's going to be low, <laughs> low in my virtual sky, and it won't shoot if I if I uh, set something reasonable. Uh, <clears throat> I can say on start, I can have it wait a period of time. I can run an external script or program. I can say, go ahead and do a pointing to the target and do a, an autofocus if I had autofocus set up. Uh, we can say we want to cool our camera. Uh, we can say how we want to handle pointing errors. I might say, you know, retry a maximum of three times. If I have a rotator, I can set that up here. Uh, there are a number of watchdogs, and again, Going back to Voyager's focus on reliability, there's a lot of behind the scenes going on here with, with uh, software watchdogs that are part of the reason why you don't have so many hangs and failures. I mean, it's looking for problems and doing its best to avoid them. Uh, it will do for a number of uh, common issues, it'll retry, but if it doesn't work after a reasonable number of retries, you know, it'll send you an alert uh, and that'll be it. I uh, have ways I can do plate solving. I can have Voyager manage the meridian flip, tell it whether you wanted to do a focus on meridian flip. Uh, I can use Voyager's uh, guide star finding, or I can use native guide control. I can set my guiding exposure from here, or I can let uh, the native exposure time uh, be used. I can set up dithering. And uh, if we want to do wait time between shots we can do that we can tell it to retry if there's an exposure error uh, here's how i can set up all my focus parameters uh, how often do i want to focus maybe focus every five frames or every so so many minutes or each change in temperature if you have a temperature sensor at attached i typically just i focus by slot and every every hour uh, but since again i don't have a focuser hooked up here i'm not going to set that up and you can also set up what you want to do if there is an error uh, and what you want to do if this runs till the night is over. And when you've done all that, you can then save it. So I've got my M45 sequence. I was playing with this yesterday and I built one. And now if you, you're typically going to have a couple of standard sequences that you run. So all these parameters that you set up, you know, you may do that once or twice uh, and then just change the target uh, and maybe change the shots that you're taking. But, um, you know, I typically I'll have something for narrow band, something for broadband, uh, and that's about it. So if we say, OK, we've now got a sequence loaded. And if we choose to run the sequence uh, from the on the fly panel, we just click run the sequence. And it's already off and running, so it's it's doing the precise pointing. And since we're using our simulator, it's tracking 100% perfectly. Nothing moved. <laughs> it didn't have to change anything. And it's already taken images. So I, I do have the, uh, the Voyager viewer. The only challenge I've got here is instead of seeing a nice image, because these are actually JPEGs that are being created in the Sky X with the, with the camera simulator. Uh, they're going to show up, you know, stretched. If I do the, the raw, you can almost see what's there. But this, the, this viewer does give a really nice, uh, a nicely stretched, auto stretched image to, to watch what's going on during the night. So we're running our sequence there. Uh, I'm going to stop it because 
it's interesting, but not that interesting. Uh, and there's another kind of uh, a built-in sequence to create flats. So this is pretty handy too. Uh, let me load one that I created already for Dawn Sky Flats. So as I said before, you can create your flats with either a panel uh, uh, or you can do Dawn Sky or, or Dusk or Sky Dusk Flats. And I've got loaded here the number of, uh, for each filter, you can set your minimum and maximum exposure, your first try of an exposure, uh, and a target ADU. So this is rather than uh, taking a lot of flats and, and measuring yourself and trying to play with the exposure time, it's, it's wonderful just to say, hey, you know, this is a, uh, a 64K max ADU uh, setting on this. So let's shoot for the middle of the range and you know, go somewhere between here and there. Uh, and uh, you figure out the exposure time for me to get to, to this ADU within the error that I allow. Now, if you're saying, well, what about seamless cameras? And you know, I, I really just, I don't care so much about the exact ADU as I care about uh, getting my exposure times closer together. Well, if you know what a good exposure time is, you, know, you might say eh, minimum, minimum five seconds, maximum five seconds. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a 50% error range. <laughs> and it's gonna take the, uh, the image and if it's within 50% of 32768, it's gonna declare victory and save your flats. So, you know, you could make these ranges a little wider. Uh, you know, it's, it's off topic, so I won't go there, but I, I do use CMOS cameras and I found with my processing, uh, I don't have to have my, my flat darks exactly matching the exposure time of my, of my uh, flats. I can be within four or five seconds and still get pretty much identical results uh, as matching the exposure time exactly. So anyway, you, you can set up a flat sequence. Uh, again, this is something that you might set up once and then you can use it forever uh, and uh, make it very easy to acquire your flats. There's no reason to have flats be, uh, be a pain. All right, uh, how are we doing on time, Christian? Are we are we still good? It's so exciting, just go on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want to overstay our welcome here. Uh, so those are uh, two of the on-the-fly sequences. There's another kind of sequence, uh, which is research and survey or mosaics. So before before Voyager had uh, mosaics, it was being used for looking for exoplanet uh, transits. And this is basically just like the sequence you saw before, but it's with multiple targets. So let's see, I got one here that I, that I loaded up yesterday because you don't want to sit here watching me load a bunch of targets. And let's see. Ah here. So project I was working on was the Roho Fuyuki uh, area, and I had a six panel mosaic. So you could use this for mosaics, or it could be for a bunch of stars that you're doing exoplanet uh, surveys on, or, you know, anything else that you're, you're doing a survey type arrangement on. Uh, or you could import your, your mosaic. So here we did our M45 that we set up before. I could set that up. And uh, boom, there I've got all those panels from that mosaic uh, imported here now. All the sequence options are just like the ones we were going through before. Again, the, the difference now is it's going gonna, it's gonna to cycle through those targets and run these shots for each of those targets. So we can set some of the options like whether to start from the, a particular panel or just the first in the grid. We can set a repeat mode to tell it how many times to repeat or just do one loop through everything or just keep looping until the night's over. Uh, we can do some things like say, hey, if you're in the middle of a loop, just skip a target if it would, if it would require a meridian crossing. Uh, so we don't want to waste time on meridian flips. Uh, but that's really it in a nutshell. I mean, it's just going to, uh, if, you're, if you're doing any kind of research or, or a mosaic and you want to have the same basic shots being taken of more than one target, you can do it very easily with this.
So we'll close out of that. Oops. And let me go over. Let's make sure we've covered enough here. We talked about camera shots, focus stars. So if you, you know, for some reason you want to pick your own focus star, you can actually just enter the coordinates. You can use your, your lookup to look up your star uh, and set it up that way. Uh, but more typically, we would say, hey, boy, let's see if, eh, yeah, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a focus star picked. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have that. I was looking for a way to just to, to demonstrate uh, Voyager picking a focus star. But since I don't have autofocus configured with my simulators, uh, I can't show you that. But, you know, typically it's, if you go into setup, on autofocus and we look at the yeah that's what i'm looking we can set up for each, on a per filter basis we can say gee for your focus stars you know use at least magnitude seven but no more than magnitude four so i can i can pick the the magnitude that i want to use based on my my system we got some defaults for narrow band and broadband. So for narrow band filters, we probably want to go for a brighter star than broadband. And we can also, uh, for the local field, uh, which was the multi-star autofocus, we can set up our exposure time and our binning and so forth. So this is this is part of your configuration setup. I again, that's something you set and forget. I've set that up three years ago and I haven't touched it <laughs> since. Uh, I think we've covered most of what's here. I mean, there are some nice things that I occasionally use, like if I'm doing calibration of uh, PhD2 and I want to go to a particular altitude in azimuth, you know, I might say, oh, you know, I want to be pointing in the somewhere in the southern sky around 140 degrees. And, you know, maybe I want to be at about 60 degrees altitude. And then I can just say go. And now my, my little virtual, you see the yellow, the yellow dot. My virtual mount is uh, is slewing to that position. Go to near zenith. I use that all the time at the start of the night, and I've got it automated in a script, like I'll show you in a minute. But I may just go point near the zenith and then do a blind solve uh, and sync to make sure everything is uh, is in the right position. So like I can actually do the blind solve from here. Uh, we got our one second. Now we see a different star field. And we're done. So the Sky X is plate solving is really fast, <laughs> works really well. I mean, this is not just with the simulated star fields. I find in real life it works really fast. Uh, and so that's a good way to get started, just to make sure you know that you've you're lined up. Uh, your mount's really pointing where your your driver thinks it is. Uh, if you have a rotator, there is a nice rotation aid here. You can. You can uh, do this for taking pictures, and I don't have the rotator uh, configured, but you can pick your target and uh, move your rotator uh, until you get to the desired position angle. Uh, or, as we showed you before, really fast, right in your uh, your sequence. You can also define right up here. You can define the position angle uh, for that sequence. Uh, and you can set it up here with the management of your rotator. And all right, so let's let's go look at scripts. So a lot of people say, "Oh, I'm not a programmer. This is this is sounding scary." Uh, this is really not quite the same as programming. This is really a sequencer of actions, uh, and they're drag and drop everything you can possibly do. Uh, in Voyager is over here in this palette. So, you know, to show you how scary a script is, you know, let's do something like we just said, uh, we want to go to near the zenith. So I drag it over here and I want to blind solve and sync. Uh, that's it. We just, we just programmed. <laughs> we made a, a script with two actions and I can save it. Actually, there's another one I did earlier. Uh, we go back over to Voyager, and we load that script up. 
blind solve and sync. And it's going to go to near the zenith and blind solve. And then I run it. So here we go. You can see in the monitor, we're going to near the zenith. We're there. We're blind solving. We took our picture. The sky X is solving and it's, it's solved. So we're done. <laughs> and we've synced. So we just, we just defined and ran a script. Uh, it, admittedly, it was a simple one. But again, it's uh, Voyager comes with a few scripts built in. Uh, like, let's say we wanted to do an exposure loop. So again, here's the script, three items. It's taken an exposure and you double click the panel. Uh, you can pick the filter, the type of frame you want to take, how long to expose, whether you're doing a subframe, uh, file name. That's it. In this case, he, he's waiting. There's a wait introduced of one second between exposures and a repeat for 200 times. And those are all things that were just dragged from over here. So, you know, we looked at the, the camera. Here's the expose item. That's this one. Uh, we've got a timing area where we pick the wait. We can wait until nighttime. We can wait until, you know, astronomical, nautical, or civil. We can wait until dusk. We can wait until dawn. Uh, and a new one, this is fairly powerful. If you have an observatory, you can wait until safe. Uh, so I use this in, in my script at the beginning of the night. I don't even connect my gear if my uh, my safety monitor from the cloud watcher is telling me, hey, <laughs> it's overcast. You're, you're not going to be doing anything for, for now. Uh, and I can confirm I'm, I'm doing a terrible thing here of jumping ahead into a, a more of a complex thing. But just to give you the idea of the, the capabilities, uh, you can say wait until safe. Uh, you can basically wait all night. So. I may set this up at four in the afternoon. I go to bed 11 o'clock at night, three in the morning, it gets clear. And the wait safe will go, hey, it's good now. Let's start running the script. And it'll image whatever is still up uh, starting at 3 AM. Uh, and I can do it with an offset as well. So I can say, you know, wait until the actual night start, astronomical, nautical, or civil. Or, you know, gee, I want to start an hour before because I'm going to take some flats. Uh, so all this is configurable. Just, again, drag and drop the action you want to take, double click it, fill in the, the blanks, uh, and you're done. So let's get rid of that one. Uh, and again, we, we could run any of these. Here's another one built in. This is to take uh, calibration frames. Now you can do these with a sequence as we saw before, but you know, if you wanna do something a little different with your, your uh, little more uh, custom, it's very easy to set it up. You know, here I've got a block. Uh, script can be, can be set into different blocks and the blocks can be targets to go to. So I can, I can move from one part of my script to another very easily with a go to. Uh, here I'm doing a, cooling the camera. And here's where you can check the results. Uh, and if it's okay, if the camera cooled successfully, and then it's going to this block for exposures and it's taking these uh, calibration frames. On the other hand, if it came back and for some reason my camera didn't reach this temperature, I've got a repeat here that says, well, try three times. So it'll, it'll go back to the beginning of this block until you get a successful exit, you know, or it'll give up. So very simple sequencing, very simple error checking to see whether something, you know, completed successfully or not. Uh, and then a decision to what you want to do uh, based on that. And so then uh, let's look at kind of the granddaddy here, since I know we've got some more advanced people in the audience. And again, this is this looks like, you know, oh my goodness, look at all these, these things. But this is, this is everything from, this, this script comes with Voyager. Uh, it works for a lot of observatory situations with just kind of going in, looking at each statement and making a few changes for your situation. Uh, this does everything from, from startup to shutdown. Uh, you know, it's, it's initializing some variables. It's doing the wait till safe that we just said. And it'll wait all night and do nothing if it never gets safe. But as soon as it gets safe, 
This is using Telegram, uh, which is an, a messaging service like SMS uh, to tell you, hey, we got a safety, it's okay to go. Then we got a startup block here where we, we do power on, we connect, cool the camera, check the mount to make sure it's parked before we open the roof, open our roof, uh, do a few things now for uh, before we start running sequences like the, uh, the blind solving to sync the mounts, run some sequences, do that all night, run flats, shut down, and we're done. And then at the very end here, I had mentioned earlier the fact that you can uh, you can get uh, events triggered by things like clouds or safety, and you can then define what happens if you have a suspend event. So I might say, you know, if it's raining, I'm going to just shut down for the night. But if it's just cloudy, I want to just suspend and wait and hope that it clears up again. So in this case, we're cooling, we're, we're warming back up again. Uh, we're going to send a message that we're shutting down. We close the flat device. We stop guiding. We park the mount. We're checking the sensor on the mount to make sure it's really parked because we don't want to move the roof if, uh, if, the, if the mount is not parked. Turn off our dew heaters. Uh, and then we wait. And then as soon as uh, if it clears up, this block is executed. We have a resume now, and we kind of do everything in reverse order check that we're parked, we open the roof and we go back, it goes back to where you were at the time of the suspension. And if, you're if you have an exit situation where you just wanna shut down, then it runs this sequence. And this is typically the same thing that you'll run at the very end of the night. So again, this is the, this is the granddaddy script that does everything. Uh, Leo built this for, uh, for some clients who had their own observatories, but it's been generalized enough that a lot of people with observatories like starting with this and just uh, customizing it to their taste. So that's a, a look at Voyager, at scripting. I think I've covered everything we talked about in our Accept Advanced. So do we wanna take a look at Voyager Advanced or are we done? <laughs> I would love to really, I, unless I see a protest, which I don't think I, I think is so exciting. Just go on, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, it won't, we won't go in depth. We'll save that maybe for another day after advance comes out of beta. We might, uh, we could easily do a half an hour, 45 minutes on advance. You're getting uh, a lot of please do. So go for it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. So Voyager advance is a, is a, a very different paradigm uh, of how to do imaging. Let's see if I remember with PowerPoint, is it shift? Ah, good, okay. <laughs> I'm sure I was gonna go back to the beginning of my presentation. Um, so advanced, you know, most of us are used to having to plan the night. So, you know, we sit down with a planetarium and we look at what's gonna be up for that night. Uh, and we carefully decide when it's gonna be at a, you know, high enough in the sky that we're, we're happy to image and what filter should we run? You know, maybe we wanna run the blue and the, clear filters at the top and maybe we can run the red filter a little lower down uh and gee what if the moon's out and what if the moon's kind of close and so there's a lot of decision making and planning and and honestly uh that was kind of my achilles heel in imaging at first you know i was all gung-ho and i loved all the planning and everything but as time wore on and i'm not in arizona <laughs> so we don't have 300 clear nights a year we might have eight eight clear nights a month if it's a good month and so, you know, all of a sudden I'd find out, oh, it's going to be clear tonight. Oh my God, it's, it's 4.30 in the afternoon and I don't have a plan yet. What am I going to image? <laughs> so I'm scrambling to do something. So the, the automated scheduler is a different approach. It says, hey, you know, you're trolling around on Astrobin or you see somebody else did something nice on iTelescope and or you read an article in Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine. Wow, that's a cool target. Uh, I'd like to image that someday, but you know, I don't know when. Well, with with a, a scheduler, you know, we go into our our mosaic or our uh, our web uh, uh, planner that I showed you before. We frame up the target nicely, uh, add it to the RoboClip database, and you don't have to add it to RoboClip, but you know, somehow we get the target's coordinates, uh, and then we set it up in the database with constraints that say. You know, I only want to image this within plus or minus one hour or two hours uh, of the meridian. 
So you know, I really just want to get good pictures when it's high in the sky. And I only want to image it when the moon is down. Uh, or maybe it's narrow band and I want the moon to be at least 90 degrees separation in the sky from this target if I run it. And then the automated robo target, as the night goes on, it will look at all your targets in your database that you want to image and it'll pick ones that currently are suitable to run. And so this is what it looks like at runtime. Uh, you get a little ephemeris uh, showing you for each of the targets. So here's a, you know, at the time that I took this screenshot, NGC 777 was in good position. Uh, and I'll show you the setup in a second. Uh, but you could see, oh, there's uh, the moon's coming up, but it's still pretty low in the sky. And NGC 777 was still relatively high. It wasn't quite a transit, but it's a little bit past uh, transit. And this blue zone was all the time that I defined with my constraints was suitable to image NGC 777. Uh, and this little progress bar shows me how far I've actually gone in my, uh, my progress. Because when I set this up as a target, I said, uh, you know, I want to get five hours with each filter. So this tells me, oh, you're 15% you're of the way done. Now, all this is in beta at this point. Um, we started the beta in January. It's been solid as a rock. I mean, I, you know, as far as stability goes, I've not had a single issue with, with running it. I'm, I'm running it on three peers. Uh, you know, Leo is just uh, adding a few features, trying not to go crazy, but adding some reports and some statistics. So you know, you'll be able to get a report at the end of the night that says what ran. Uh, but the you know the real focus now is just what's the uh, a good feature set that uh, is good enough for release uh, while maintaining stability. And since we're all enthusiasts, of course, we get a million ideas to what you should be. <laughs> what would be a great feature to add? Uh, I'll show you the the tool that you use to set up your database. So this is the the target manager. So I'm currently, actually, I'm connected to the Edge HD uh, database right now. Uh, and you, so I didn't even go through profiles uh, with Voyager before. Let me show you in two seconds here. Uh, so for each imaging system, uh, you can create a profile. And since I'm connected to everything now, it's not letting me open. If I disconnected, I could open and save a new profile. But basically, everything that was in that setup area can, can be saved to a profile. So if you're running you know, three, four, or five different OTAs uh, on the same mount, but you're swapping at different times, different cameras, uh, you can create a profile for each. So back over here in, uh, in Voyager, uh, I'm sorry, in the RoboTarget Manager, when I connect, <clears throat> there's all my profiles. So I got a bunch of different profiles that I have just residing on that machine. That's the one. Uh, that's active. So it's got a little red line around it. Uh, for each profile, you can create multiple uh, base sequences. So if you remember the sequence editor that we looked at before, where we defined all the different guiding and focusing parameters, uh, you basically say, yeah, this is, this is kind of my template that I want to use for everything that I'm shooting here. Uh, or I should say, you, you can define 50 of these if you want to, and then you can associate the base uh, sequence with a particular target. Uh, so let's, let's look at a target. So here's M109. Uh, I created a set called Galaxies. And again, I can have as many different sets as I want, and you can have lots of interesting philosophical discussions about what's the right way to group things in sets, because I can, I can enable and disable everything in, in this group as a set. So I can enable all or disable all the targets in a set. So people are debating, you know, should we put all our narrow band targets in a set? Should we put, uh, you know, spring targets together in a set? A lot of ways you can go. Uh, but if we look at a particular target, there's that base sequence. So I, I, I just have two. I've got a, a narrow band and a broadband uh, base sequence. It's going to use everything from that base sequence except the definition of the shots that I want to take. So that I define here the shots that I want to take of that target. And that, that basically gets plugged into the base sequence 
uh, and defines what what to take. So in this case, you know, I'm taking uh, luminance filter, 60 seconds. This is a, this has got an o, uh, uh, an OSC camera on it right now, color camera. So I've got a luminance filter and a, a dual narrow band filter, which I just have as H. Uh, so those are the shots uh, that I want to take. But if we go back to the target definition, uh, and again, here, if I'm if I'm creating a new target, once again, I can go back to RoboClip. This is this is now my RoboClip that's on the H uh, the Edge HD PC running Voyager. So this is not the one that I just showed you a minute ago. This is actually the remote. Uh, RoboClip database. Uh, but the nice thing here is you can run the RoboTarget manager on your desktop PC. So I can I can easily bounce between my three different scopes uh, from this one target manager without having to use like a remote desktop to go to go in. Uh, so anyway, you can you can pull a target from RoboClip. You can use Sesame, which is the Aladdin online search. If you've got a planetarium connected, you can use the, the search uh, here to to find a target. Uh, and then you can turn the target on or off here. And you can say, you know, for all the shots I've defined for this, uh, you know, do it five times or 50 times or 100 times. <laughs> one, of the, one of the fun parts about having a fixed observatory and three peers running is you find yourself swimming in data after a while. So uh, it gets a little silly. But uh, as I'm sure many of you know, once you get above 15, 20, 25 hours of data on a target processing sure gets easier uh, than if you're, you know, unless it's a super bright target. But I can set priority uh, of my target. So, so if I have this as a, as a high or first priority, then as long as the constraints are met, you know, it's going to run probably ahead of everything else that I've got just as normal. So if I get desire to run something urgently, I can set a higher priority. Position angle, altitude of the target, minimum altitude. Uh, I've got these set to run between plus or minus two hours of the meridian. You can set a date or a time. Uh, you can say only only image when the moon is down. Uh, I can set a moon phase max over this. I put 80% uh, maximum, but I can also say or moon down. So, you know, if the moon's down, I don't really care. <laughs> it can be won't be 100%, but it could be 80%, and it's down for two hours at the end of the night, and I just want to image. Uh, and you can even uh, set a constraint by the, the HFD that you're willing to accept. So if it's not a great seeing night and you don't want to bother with it, uh, you can set one there. You can also say max sequence time for the night. So I might say, I really want to get five targets tonight, so don't let this thing hog, you know, hog the scope. Set it to this can run for 60 minutes max. Now there's another global setting in RoboTarget that says, hey, you know, ignore this if there's nothing else available. So it will, you know, if this is the only thing available, even if you've said limit it to 60 minutes and it's already run 60 minutes, you can decide I'd rather run it than just sit doing nothing. Uh, and if you like air mass instead of altitude, you can you can set air mass here for your target uh, constraint. So once you've set all that up. Uh, for your target, and you've defined some shots. That's it. So you know you go back into uh, to Voyager, and again I can either just like with the on the fly for sequences, I can run from here, and it's not going to run because my PC time is two in the afternoon. It's going to say it's not dark out. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, but you click run here and. It, it will now go look at the database, look at my constraints, and pick the best target to run uh, based on the current constraints. Or you can go into your script, and instead of saying run a sequence, you can say run robo target. So basically, what I, what I did when I got the beta, uh, I took my all night imaging script, which previously had I had seven different sequence slots. And I would put a different sequence in each of the slots, um, and I would just rotate through those. But I'd have to go in and you know basically update my my sequence slots and my script based on the targets that were suitable for that time. I deleted those, added one slot, that, or added one action to run Robo Target, and I was done. I could literally run my exact same script, uh, and now it would use the the Robo Target uh, scheduler 
and I just loaded my targets into the database and I've been running it that way ever since. So uh, it's, it's, it's a fun, different way of imaging. You know, if, if you're the, the type of imager that drags your scope out you know, once a month and you just want to take pictures of M42, it's way overkill. <laughs> uh, but if you're, uh, even if you're an occasional imager, but you're active enough that you, you don't like finding yourself in the last minute scramble to plan the night, uh, it's nice to be able to just grab targets uh, as you see them and load them into the database. And then when the time comes, they'll run. So uh, 